You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to a special capsule of No Filter, all about sisterhood, made possible by Frozen the Musical. Now, usually No Filter is a weekly interview podcast with people who tell their stories very candidly and vulnerably. And while that's still the case, over the next three weeks, we're going to be celebrating sisterhood, from actual sisters to how women supporting women has changed people's lives professionally and personally. Claire and Jessie Stevens are twin sisters, and they work here at Mamma Mia. Are you guys right? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, oh, Sorry, I've, I have about 11 Slack messages. I've just been... It's so fine. Just All right. think about what the first question might be. Yeah. They have different it, roles, of course. They don't job share. But they are twins working for the same company. Claire is the editor-in-chief of the website. So that means she is the boss of every written article that you see on Mamma Mia. And she runs the editorial team here. And Jessie... Well, she does a few things. She's one of the hosts of Mamma Mia Out Loud with me and Holly Wainwright. She also hosts the True Crime Conversations podcast. She's also the assistant head of content and she dates my son. I know, it's a lot. I don't have a sister or a twin. I'm wildly jealous of anyone who does. So I've always been intrigued by how their relationship as sisters and friends and work colleagues work. Which is why Jessie and Claire were the first people that I thought of when we were putting together this special three-part series all about sisterhood. So how do you share the same life as someone else after coming from inside the same body? What happens when one doesn't like the other one's partner? And how far would they actually go for one another? How old were you two when your twin brothers were born? Two and a half years old we were. Yes. So you would have no memory of life really without them before there were four of you under three? No, but you know when you don't know if it's a memory or if it's just stories you've been told. So when we were nine months old, Claire was always the weaker twin, continues to be. Oh, great. You're smaller. (laughs) Yeah, so she was three pounds, I was six, so I ate all the food in the womb. And then I kind of pushed her out of the womb first and I went, finally, this is my chance to really spread out. So I spread out and then the doctors couldn't get me out and my elbow got stuck because I was like, I want to stay here for a bit. Anyway, we get to nine months old and I was playing with a table that had like wheels on it, like a trolley table. And I ran Claire over like her leg and I broke it when she was nine months old. It was called a spiral fracture. Yeah, because she actually spiraled my leg. Out. Baby leg. Do you remember violent. that, Claire? No, but I feel Jessie says it's it slowed me down my whole life. It's really slowed her do. down. Like to this day, you know, you see her walk and you're Good like, Good tactic. <laughs> haven't, haven't nailed it. So then she went to the hospital and mum and dad say that to this day, that's the happiest they've ever seen me when I was an only child. I had this little six week period where I was an only child. Claire was in the hospital with her leg up in a sling. And I was loving life. They said they used to take me out to like restaurants and stuff and I would just guzzle down all the food, wouldn't stop smiling. And then she came back and not only was I a twin again, but one of four. Mm. People must say all the time, what's it like to be a twin? But you've got nothing to compare it to except for that brief time when you put your sister in hospital, Jessie. What do people not know about being a twin, Claire? I think... They probably wouldn't understand the level of closeness. Just from what I see of other siblings where, you know, people don't even particularly talk to their siblings a lot or don't necessarily share a lot, I don't understand that at all because Jessie and I can say anything to each other in terms of criticism or ask each other any questions or, like, there's probably some very strange things that we do that people would not What would they be? Like if Claire came over tonight... And I was in the shower. Then she'd come in and sit on the toilet and then we'd chat. Yeah. And and people might be like, oh. I don't have a sister, let alone a twin, but I don't think that's very weird. Okay. Well, we would do things like that. We'll also, when we fight, we If Claire got a tampon stuck, Jessie. Oh, I'd get it out in a heartbeat. Yeah. Claire? Yeah. And, like, we show each other, like, gross things. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) And then, like, if we had a fight, Claire would say to me, you've always been a bitch. 
you've always been a bitch and this is consistent with your behaviour across the years, like this thing you did when we were 14 mm. and then 17 and she brings it back and I say, well, you're a mean person and we just fight, fight, fight and then it's like, have you ever physically fought? Yes. yes. We have a very <laughs> funny story about that. So our brothers think it's the funniest thing that ever happened. We were fighting before work one day. We were going to work at uh, – we worked at a bar at a golf club. So you club. were adults? We were adults. Oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. Were like we were like in our 20s. 20s. <laughs> and I must have done something annoying. And Jessie got her hand and just <laughs> whacked my back. And I went – Ah, and like made a big drama and then Jessie started crying immediately because she felt so bad and she was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. So I didn't and mean to hit you so hard. And Jack and Nick looked at it and they're like, you guys are the weirdest people. They they ever. actually got it on video because I started crying louder than Claire <laughs> going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't tell mum, don't tell mum. <laughs> don't tell mum. <laughs> I was in my 20s. We have a hole in our childhood bedroom yeah. from a shoe. Yeah, you throwing a shoe. Yep. Yeah. Um, missed me and hit the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Which is lucky. There's so much. Passion. I think you've got a um, scar on your shin because I we were playing hockey in the front yard with golf clubs, and, and Claire I got just got a putter and went <laughs> into her shin. Yeah, but that was accidental or not? Um, I not think I was fun. pretty annoyed at you. You weren't playing fair. You're not very physically affectionate with each other that I've seen. Although you're not very physically affectionate with anyone. No, like that's just not your Ew. family's vibe. We'd never hug. That would be weird. You'd never hug each other. Ew, that no. would be so weird. Or like put my arm around, like even if you're crying, I'd be like, oh, sweetie, but I wouldn't touch you. You don't hold hands or Ugh. like no. stroke each other's hair or play with each other's hair or any of those sometimes things? Sometimes when we're writing a recap because we write for Mamma Mia sometimes together and we'll do reality TV recaps and like Claire will say, I'll type for a bit if you braid my hair. Mm. And so we do that and then I dictate and Claire types and so we, we sometimes we <laughs> do that is sort of our vibe and we were talking recently about this and how when you're a twin, particularly a female twin, and I think sisters who are close get the same thing, when you walk into a social situation together, women look at you differently. So, for example, whether it's walking into Mamma Mia or it's walking into Year 7 or... Walking into you know, a dinner with a group of people. There is this sense of... I suppose resentment or something because women look at you and think you've already got a team. So you don't come in as this vulnerable individual, mm. you come in as a team. And there can be this real people getting their back up and kind of either being critical or not particularly welcoming and then you further self-isolate, which I see a lot of twins do, and then there's a bit of distance. And I think we've experienced a lot of that. And Claire found an article the other week about how – this obsession with twins and this interest in twins is actually a discussion about loneliness and how a lot of people, mm. um, men and women, look at twins and think, imagine never being lonely. Imagine having someone from the moment you're born who's just on your team to talk to, who's a part yeah, of Like you. you didn't even come into the world alone. Like people yeah. always say, you come into the world alone, you leave the world alone. We didn't come into the world alone. And I it's think like twinness is this antidote to loneliness. Is yeah. it? Yeah. Claire? I think so. And I think maybe it then informs how you kind of interact with other people because I've always been the type of person who has a few very close relationships and it's usually a pair. So I've been with my partner for 12 years and it's just me and him. And I'm so comfortable in that dynamic, me and one other person and you're a team and a duo and that sort of thing. And then obviously with Jesse, whereas with a big group of people, I'm like, oh, I don't really know what to do mm. in this situation. This is a bit strange. But with the loneliness thing, I do think I can't imagine going into a situation and knowing, like some people have had experiences, most people have had experiences where they are completely on their own. They're being bullied or ostracised or and there's shame and there's all these feelings that I probably haven't had because I've always had somebody on my side. Or feeling misunderstood. It's like you walk mm. into a new workplace and no one knows who you are and you've got to prove yourself and you've got to put yourself out of your comfort zone to make friends. We haven't had to do that, which makes you a really weird person. Yes. Yes. But, Jesse, I've heard you talk about periods in your life where you've been incredibly lonely. It's interesting because that's corresponded with Claire leaning very much into her relationship. I suppose I had periods of loneliness throughout school, which I think were actually to do with this mean girl thing of you've got a team, so we're going to put you both down. Like I was going to ask how it works with friendships in school when there's two of you. 
there's been a lot of cases throughout our lives when people have tried to get really close to to one twin and not the other and it's never worked. Yeah. And they've actually tried to do it with cruelty and sort of been like, I remember a girl kind of taking me under her wing and being quite critical of Claire and trying to take that position a bit. And I was like, oh, that's really not how it works. Like how embarrassing. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Ever. And then that ultimately and falls I think, away. I think people also don't know what to do with it. They're confused because I like a lot of female relationships are kind of about talking about other people and they know that they can't really bitch to me about Jessie or vice versa. No, which is funny because you've both bitched to me and I've heard you bitch to other people about each other. <sighs> All the time. But no one would ever Mm-mm. Yeah. Don't try. agree. Yeah, because yeah. I'd be like, hey, that's my sister. Yeah. You can't say that. Yeah. I can say it. But there is something threatening. It's the same as if you had a best friend who you were joined at the hip with and every social situation you walked in together, it would be threatening to the women around you because it's like, well, we're never going to get that close to her anyway. So how does someone become close to both of you? I can think of, for example, Andy, Mm -hmm. who now weirdly also works at (laughs) Mamma Mia. (laughs) She has been a close friend of yours since school how did that dynamic work? Because three is a crowd, notoriously. I'd feel so left out if I was friends with twins. I think um, that we've both had to develop that friendship, like, independently. Yes. And also as the three of us. And we have different things in common. Like, with Andy, her husband went to school with my boyfriend. And so, so there's that mm. connection that Jessie doesn't necessarily have, but then there'll be a different connection. She's also had to be a negotiator. Yeah. She's had to be, and she resents this, and she's very interesting when she talks about it, but, like, she's had to be the arbiter in between fights yeah. and having to, like, too. yeah, I think she finds that really difficult. Mm. But I think because you've been through that, it just means that the three of you are stronger, but we're a mm. group of three and, like, that's kind of understood. Tell me a bit more about that dynamic when Claire and Rory got together. You were, what, at school still or you were? Yes, so 17. Yeah. Jessie, what was that like to see your twin pair off? I felt betrayed and left out. I think when they first got together, I had a partner, so it was okay. It was when I was then single with this twin who was so happy and so content and finding her own identity with this person apart from me that I think I spiralled into like really deep loneliness because it was so unfamiliar and I'd be like, I need Claire on Saturday night and Claire was like, I've got somewhere else to be Mm -hmm. and I resented that and I think was probably a little bit difficult with her partner as well. That's been an interesting relationship because there's some jealousy and maybe some rivalry between you and Rory in particular or any partner that Claire might have had. I mean, it's hard to say because she's only had one partner. (laughs) I think it is. And then Rory eventually became like a brother now. And we never, we never had that period of when you're just nice to someone because they're a stranger. Like Mm. I'm pretty, you know, if someone new started at work, I would imagine, you know, you're pretty polite to them. I've never been especially polite to Rory and he's never been especially polite to me. And we'll have yelling fights, but we're also really, really close. You and Rory will. Yes, yes. And how does that make you feel, Claire? <laughs> I'm like a therapist. Claire, how do you feel about I'm that? I'm glad when they do because it keeps me out of it completely. But don't and you feel torn? Like You side with Rory? I side with Rory like all the time. <laughs> I think Jessie's a bit of a psychopath. No. no, I side with Rory. I don't know why. Like I very often think he's wrong, but I do side with him. And I think maybe because I know that you'll forgive me. Do you yeah, know what I mean? So it's true. almost like my relationship with you is more solid. So I'm like, should we fine if I just yeah. if I just side with Rory? We've been saying for years that we do need to see a therapist because yeah. our relationship is increasingly toxic. So I feel like this is really um <laughs> yes. actually helpful. quite helpful. This is probably good. When Claire and Rory moved overseas for a little while, how old were you both then? I was 23 or 24, something like that. Was that the longest that you'd been apart? Yes, I think we hadn't even spent a week apart in our whole lives mm. when that happened. Maybe we'd had a, you know, the odd European holiday or something and not mm. seen each so other. So what were the good and bad parts of that for you, Jessie? I started doing my master's degree that year and I entered uni. Claire and I had gone to the same uni, so did different subjects, but we were a pair. And I walked into this class as Jessie Stevens, not Jessie and Claire Stevens. 
And it was so liberating and I met this group of people who didn't even know I was a twin and I think it was foundational to like forging my own identity and my own interests and it was the weirdest thing. I was single and so I was kind of, you know, I saw this guy for a few months and then I saw this other guy for a few months and Claire never met any of them Mm. and it's so weird when I talk about them because I'm like in my head you were there but you weren't there for any of it. How did you stay in contact I reckon we spoke on the phone every couple of days at least and, like, messaging each other. Did it feel dislocating? Yeah, it was pretty weird. And I remember when we left we cried Mm. and then I came back. I visited her twice. Mm. But at the end of the year, like, I came back to get you and that was Mm. really weird because a twin told me years and years ago I went out with a guy whose brother was a twin and he was a lot older and he said to me, you be careful of that twin relationship because – you think that you can handle the distance and you think that if you move away, you'll always have it, but you don't always have it. Him and his Mm. twin had lived on other sides of the world and he just said, we've lost it now. And, like, we see each other Mm. in our 40s and it's not there anymore. And, like, it's something you've got to keep working on and and keep that closeness. Mm. And so that was in the back of my head, but as soon as we saw each other, it was just like completely normal Mm. and then you had the same thing didn't you because what was it like for you Claire when you were away so it was good because I got to like same experience I got to walk into a workplace and meet a group of people and it was just me which is really challenging because especially with a completely different culture where they're all super outgoing and that sort of thing and you feel a bit like a fish out of water anyway but luckily I find that people I don't know if it is the twin thing but maybe because I am a bit quieter I had a girl, literally I was working for about a week and a girl was like, I like you, you can be my friend. And I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, thank you for rescuing me. And so that was really good. So I made some really, really close friends while I was over there. And it was also a great experience for Rory and I to have our own little place and have our own little adventures and that sort of thing. Um, what was hard about it for you? I found that I probably grew a lot in terms of independence and I guess becoming more of a grown up. And then when Jessie came to visit in the middle of the year, there was a bit of an odd dynamic because I felt like I had grown a certain amount and Jessie hadn't. So I remember we had a huge fight. Jessie got there and she just, she did a few things like borrow my phone and use all the money on it. And just annoying things like that, that I was like, no, like I've been living independently. And I was like, this is how things work. Yeah. And I was like, this isn't how things work anymore. Like, this is not yours. My things are my things. So I felt like it took a little bit of a while to get that dynamic back again. And I remember getting quite when I came and visited you in the middle of the year and you were like, here are my friends. I was like, no. Why do you have your own friends? Like, and, je- and I remember I you felt saying, left out. I remember you saying, I feel like she just wants to talk to you. And I was like, yeah, because it's my friend. <laughs> Is my friend. She doesn't know you. She knows me. So that it was a real decoupling. I mean, they say there's that stage with a, a mother and a baby where around a certain age, I can't remember what it is, developmentally, a baby realises that they're, they're a separate. separate entity to the mother. Mm. It's like So with they're you, it's mind. like your clothes, your body, your mm. r- friendships, your phone data plan, mm. they're all mine. Yeah, yeah. What's yours is mine. Exactly. And does that sort of go away and come back? Yes. Yeah. Because then it did. We moved in together like shortly after that. And I think it's also... You moved out of home. And was it ever a question that you wouldn't live together? No. It was just a given that we'd move in me, Claire Rory, (laughs) which was probably terrible for our relationship, (laughs) Mum would say. I'm a lot tidier than Claire. Oh, you are. I think it's just very difficult as well when you know, my partner now would come over and just be like, I can't believe you still share a wardrobe, you still share makeup, you just share everything and we drive each other nuts with like, I bought this top and you spilt sauce on it and you didn't clean it. Yeah. Which that's probably toxic in its own way. But throughout this whole period, Claire and I always intended to work as a team together, Mm. I think. Even when you were overseas in Boston, it was like we were writing this blog together because – we liked writing together, which we still did by distance. So I think there was this aim that... That you would somehow 
Just quickly, what did you each do after school and what did you want to do as a career, Claire? So I studied psychology. So I did an honours in psychology and then I was doing my master's but realised I didn't want to be a clinical psychologist. And then that's when it became obvious that I wanted to do something creative with Jessie. So whether it's documentary making or you know, in those days it was a radio show. <laughs> it would now be a podcast, I guess. <laughs> or blogging. And yeah. I had done a, like a master's of research in history and gender studies. And we had this idea that we wanted to study academic things and then bring them to the public. Because I was finding that increasingly I would write these things I was really proud of and maybe two people read them, which is what working at uni, at mm. uni which is what working in academia does. So it was like, do you go on and do a PhD and spend three years writing 100,000 words that it feels like hardly anyone is going to read? Or do you go into something more mainstream, sort of rearrange your ideas a bit so that the average person can understand what you're talking about, but draw meaning from it, I suppose. And that's kind of what we both wanted to do. We've never, ever looked very far into the future. So How were you earning money? Working at the golf club. Working at the golf club. Yeah, we worked at a golf club that just did weddings and all that kind of stuff. So you worked in hospitality for years and years while you studied. Yes. I I lived at home but then moved out together. Yeah, I was also a tutor at uni. So that's when I sort of first cross paths with you, you were writing recaps of The Biggest Loser yep. on a website called The New Matilda. Yes. Yeah. Yes, How did yes. that come about? So I was doing my master's in obesity and eating disorders and so having a very academic look at all of that stuff and I just became obsessed with it and became obsessed with the idea of fat phobia and how pertinent. It's, it's when you read that stuff and you go, oh, my gosh, I've lived with this happening in society my whole life and I never knew what to call it and what the language around it was. And my research was about health, like public health messages for obesity and eating disorders and how one kind of promotes the other, how messages about obesity actually kind of promote eating disorders and vice versa. We had always watched The Biggest Loser, (laughs) which I am ashamed to admit, and that's exactly what it does. It's so, it was... So you wanted to write a comedic recap as in the great tradition of recaps that have been going on for quite a lot of years now. Yeah, of the most damaging show on television. Did you think of pitching it to Mamma Mia? Were you aware of Mamma Mia at the time? I think we did. We had written a few submissions for Mum Mia. But I look back and we didn't know what we were doing. Like, no, we didn't, we didn't know, know the tone. We didn't know anything about journalism. But we, we also didn't know. know how to pitch. No, so it was like God, we didn't. No. We would kind of send a link and be like, hi, we wrote a thing, but we didn't have a headline really and we didn't know how to sell yes, ourselves. Yes, like now I'm in my position. I'm like, if I received that, I would have thought, Ugh, and then press delete. <laughs> <laughs> but the new Matilda said yes. Were you getting paid for it? Uh, I think we did in the end a little bit, but yes. at first it was just because we loved doing it. Yeah, and the it idea was, was just to get people to read it. And it started to get a following. Yeah, and a very small And I saw it on Facebook. Someone posted a link to it on Facebook and I was intrigued by this idea of this joint byline, these two girls, Jessie and Claire Stevens, which I'd never seen before. Mm. And I assumed you were sisters. I didn't yet know you were twins. So I did some light stalking and reached out very tentatively because the new Matilda, I don't think it's around anymore, but it was a very kind of cool, woke publication Mm. and woke people don't tend to think much of me or Mamma Mia. So I was like nervous about approaching you. I thought you could be part of the Twitter mob that just hates me. Which is hilarious because we didn't have Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) And so I reached out and what happened from that point of view, from your guys' point of view? So I remember I had been having a fight with Rory that night. Uh, we were at home. We we're at, still living at home. And maybe I was having a fight with both of you. But I, I know I was having, <laughs> I was in the middle of a fight with no, Rory. No, we were having a fight too. Maybe we were yeah. having a fight. And then I got the email because I guess it was my email on the blog. And I got this email. And my first thought was, this is really mean that somebody has pretended to be Mia Friedman and reach out. Like that's bullying. Because I was like, why? Come on now. Don't get my hopes up. Yeah, don't get my hopes up. And then I was like, maybe it's really her. And we were fighting, but you were like, okay, we've got to put that aside for me. Yeah. And so I remember going into the study and being like, I know we're not talking, <laughs> but I think Mia Friedman just emailed us. And, just and we were like, like oh what? my God. And then we went and told mum, who was just like, oh, cool. And then the weirdest thing was that it had only been weeks before, I reckon two weeks before that we had gone to an event that you spoke at. And so we were like, yes, 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 love her, love her. And then that's why it seemed mean that somebody was pretending to be you. And then <laughs> but it was you. I basically <laughs> said, I'd like to meet you. So what did you think when you came into the Mamma Mia office? 
We um, didn't know how to dress and we had to ask our cousin who worked in Surrey Hills how you're <laughs> meant to dress when you work in Surrey Hills. Because we'd never had an office job before. And so she was like, oh, wear a nice top and jeans. And we we're like, okay, I don't think I did that. I think I did something weirder. And we came and it was so overwhelming. What were your impressions when you walked in? Just, oh, my God, I so, uh, and wish for, I could work here. <laughs> yeah, and for context, like we grew up in West Ride and mum and dad are teachers and I don't think we'd ever actually walked into an office before with working people and like an office in the city where it's cool no because everyone in our family are teachers literally everyone (gasps) so we didn't know what like professional what a workplace was. yeah I was gonna use the word corporate I don't even know what that means no no, because mama me has never been corporate it's very (laughs) but they were sitting at computers that yep there were desks there were desks computers yeah and people like sitting and concentrating and I was like oh look at them all And we walked in, it was so colourful and light and it felt like we didn't even belong in that environment. And then we were interviewed by you, by Kate DeBrito, who's now at News, Holly Holly. Wainwright, terrifying, a bunch of people Mm. and asked a whole bunch of questions. And I remember we pitched this terrible idea in hindsight. And Kate, who is an incredible editor and really, really no BS. Mm. Just challenged it. She was the editor of Mamma yes. Mia and she's now the editor of News.com. Yeah, video. and this is what she did best is she just looked at this idea and basically went, no, that doesn't stand. And we're like, oh, wow, she's completely right. Yeah. And was That that must have been quite intimidating. I don't know why I pulled yeah. I think I was just like, look at these two girls. I think they're talented but I don't know what to do with them. Yeah. What do you think? And yeah. so I, I brought in the best brains in the business to sort of check you both out. It was like we were in a zoo Yeah, and there were all these people looking at us from different angles being like, I don't get it, but <laughs> <laughs> Mia might be onto something. And we were like, look, we're not completely sure Mia's onto something. <laughs> But we're here and we got the train. It. We got the train. And, and, it's like, and it's like we're naive enough to not even be aware of the fact that people are like, what the hell? Like we were so naive that I don't think it even crossed our minds. I expected you to be a lot more confident than you were because your writing is so confident and extroverted and you came yeah, in and I we always describe goblins. you as little goblins or little <laughs> hobbits. You were sort of like hunched over and very small and you just Sorry. didn't look how I thought you would look, not no. from a from a superficial point of view, yeah. but just you didn't have any presence. You were very nervous and you're very oh, extroverted. Terrified. You're still like that. You still, neither of Goblins. you have that kind of walk into a room yeah. confident presence. Yeah. yeah. But there was still something there that I wanted to explore. So I think I invited you to come and do a couple of paid weeks mm. work experience or internship. Yeah. And then I remember you said to me, our mum, and you told me that you had twin brothers and you were saying our brothers work together and our mum thinks it's really unhealthy <laughs> that our brothers work together and the last thing she would want is for us to work together because I didn't have one job, let alone two, yeah. and I think I said that to you. Yeah, yeah, you did, except we refused to leave. Like I remember it would get to like 7 o'clock and we were writing these stories that are so bad. And They're the editor so was probably like, I'm not going to publish this. <laughs> But don't, they don't they were so nice about back. it. But they were probably terrible. But we just stayed back. And this is the good thing about having no vision for the future or any goals. Yeah. Is that you just stay doing what you're doing and you're not too anxious about it. Yeah. You're like, Did I you just... have a game plan for that two weeks? Did you go, right, this is what we want to achieve. This is how we're going to do it. And at the end of each day, did you go, okay, how can we make it better tomorrow? What Claire and I love, and I wonder if other twins could relate to this, is that I think we're routinely underestimated. Yeah. Because we have no presence yeah because we lack confidence yeah we have a really underdog don't mentality wear shoes. we yeah. often don't wear shoes people don't. think we're a lot like when we walked in people remember, think we're idiots no no no. <laughs> but but one girl said I thought you were 16 yeah that's and I thought you were high school students and yeah. then I read something you wrote and I thought that's not bad for a high school student turned out we were like older than her mm. but I don't know I think we, we had it at school too it was like I remember a teacher saying to me you did really well in your exams but all I've ever thought of you as is the girl who forgets her hat like yeah. I'm just a clumsy kind of. <laughs> Didn't you guys top the state in your something? HSC? In, yeah, in the HSC, and mm-hmm. it it shocked. We love being underestimated. Yes. It's like mm. everyone <laughs> thinks you're an idiot, and then you just shut your mouth and put your head down and let the work do the talking. That's very much our mm. philosophy. I remember we had a couple of conversations about wouldn't it be funny if we do Survivor? Like, there's only <laughs> one job. Who's going to get yeah. it? And I think that's what happened. There yeah, was a Claire job got the first job. Claire got yep. the first job. It was yep. like an entry-level job. Yeah, but we had always had in our heads, it'll come up. There's one 
And I think Jesse said, I think you're ready for it. Why don't you do it? Yeah. And did you um, decide amongst yourselves? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it was a very specific type of job, like loading posts or whatever. And I and Jesse was like, you do that. You're good at that. I, I like, fixed okay. videos in the back end for a month. Yeah. I tell people that. I'm very, very proud. You also it was tried the, to the most film videos, which was embarrassing. Yeah, I couldn't film videos and I thought you could fake it till you make it. You can't. <laughs> so did you see a career path for yourselves here? Like once you saw what goes on in an office, what goes on in a media company, did you start to go, I would ultimately like Kate DeBrito's job, who's the editor? No. And I think people, you're probably meant to do that. You're probably meant to see, and now I have like conversations with my team about what they want, and they're like, "I want to do this, and then this, and then I'll be in this position." And I'm just in awe because I never had We've that. Always more had the philosophy that's like, "Keep doing what you find interesting, and you'll end up somewhere interesting." Yeah. So if you just follow your gut, there was a moment here where it was like, "Hey, we'd actually love to train you up in video." I remember talking to Mum about it, and I was like, "I just don't think that's where my heart is." So I've kind of mm. got to say no to that, and then just go. Mm. Whatever my gut is saying, I know I feel most my, like myself when I'm writing and when I'm talking. So I'd love to do podcasting and love to mm. do writing or whatever. And then you just kind of keep stumbling towards that and, mm. you know, good things happen. You're listening to the No Filter Sisterhood series with me, Mia Friedman and Jesse and Claire Stevens. We haven't talked about the competitive aspect of being a twin Working not just in the same industry but in the same workplace, Mm -hmm. Claire, you got the first job. Mm. Then, Jesse, you got a gig on the podcast, which was a pretty big gig. Then, Claire, you became the editor. Mm -hmm. How have you navigated that? I think there can be a bit of tension and I guess there's competitiveness that's definitely been good at times because it it keeps you – like if I can see that Jesse's writing – a lot of great stories. I think, oh, I've got to do the same thing. And I also look at it and think, if Jesse can do it, I can do it, which is probably, you know, not necessarily even true, but it's a good thought to have. But I think where it gets bad, Jesse and I always have conversations about this. My dad is a bit, we call him a martyr. So he does things he doesn't like and then just spends his life complaining about it. And sometimes I can do that. So I'll do things and be working really late or be doing a task that I don't need to be doing and that just isn't really important. important. And then I'll say, why don't you have to do this? I'm doing this. Why don't you have to do this? And Jessie's like, I'm much better at boundaries and saying what I refuse to do. Yeah, that's been really interesting. And it's probably a bit of a lesson. Were people threatened? I know there were some issues at the start where – Some people found it, oh, there's two of them. How did you navigate that in the workplace? I think I am really socially oblivious to a lot of things. (laughs) So I often find things out later. So I she probably wouldn't mind me saying this, lies. Um, (laughs) Producer lies, now head of podcasts. Yes, head of podcasts. She said to me about a year later, she said, oh, yeah, I I just had, I was super jealous and didn't know what you were doing. Like, why were you here and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I thought you were just my friend. (laughs) Like. Because you were clearly rising stars within the organisation. Yeah, I was totally oblivious to it. Yeah, we were missing all the context and Mm. what comes with Mia bringing you in and going, look at the new sparkly things Mm. and how that might make other people feel. And because we just didn't understand the dynamics of a business or how anyone else got a job, I'm glad we didn't because I think that would have been really hard if we had been aware of it. Yeah. But in hindsight, it's funny because we'll look at other people. So sometimes Mia will bring somebody new in and we're like, oh. And then we think, oh, my God, that's so mean. That's what happened to us. Yeah. (laughs) Like, that's exactly. Sibling rivalry. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't last very long. (laughs) When we were doing Out Loud at one point, Jessie was extremely single Mm -hmm. and she was road testing different, I was going to say road testing different guys. You were basically dating, doing all of that kind of stuff. I get the sense it wasn't a very happy time for you. No. What was that like for you, Claire, to be so happy in such a long-term relationship and have watched your sister, you know, find a a lot of dickheads? I didn't understand it. I've always thought it's a bit of a biological thing that twins or siblings don't go for the same type Type. of people because I guess that would get really complicated if siblings were interested in the same people. But the type of people Jessie was going out with, I just didn't understand. And I think that put a bit of a rift because I thought I understand every decision Jessie makes. I understand 
Like I'm always on the same page, but I do. I would look at a guy and think that guy clearly has addiction issues. I don't know why you would go mm. that way. Like, and he's not nice to you. He's not and nice. He's not. Our family doesn't like him. Yeah. And, yeah, and he's not even fun to be around. Like I just don't get it. Whereas I've always had such I don't know vanilla taste. Like, <laughs> so Claire, when how did she tell you that she'd met this guy at work? <laughs> So I, um, when Luca started, I trained Luca and I did really like him. I thought, oh, damn it, he's really smart and super, super creative. We became friends with him and then I forget why your friendship seemed to accelerate faster. Well, I guess he liked you and so and so that. <laughs> but I'm trying to think there must have been, oh, you were in the same team. Yeah, we were. I yeah, was in yeah. a bit of a different team. You're in the same team. And so your friendship Here it, developed. It, it, the same editorial yeah, part of Yeah, exactly. Team, and yeah. so you were sort of hanging out more and more. And then I remember Jesse saying to me, like, oh, I think he likes me. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's a shame because <laughs> you're not going to do that because we've worked really hard. And if you were to have any interest in the boss's son, I would shoot you in the middle of your eyes. <laughs> So I just said, no, that shan't be happening. And then, But when you say no, it makes me want to do it more. And then she wanted to do it more. And I said, no, it still shall not be happening. And then I remember you saying, I think I just need to kiss him and then I'll know. And I was like, but that's even worse because then you're going to kiss him and then what if you don't like him? And then, like, that's going to be a million times worse. And then you're like, oh, no, I, <laughs> I do like him. And I was so mad. I was mad about it for several months. Mm. And then there was you a thought moment, it was a terrible idea yes. because of his age, or the age no, difference, or because of who he was. The age wasn't part of it. It was just I thought, Jesse, <laughs> you make bad decisions. We know this, and I thought it's annoying because we've worked really hard, and I would hate anybody to think that the mm. work that you've done or the work that I've done wasn't important because now you're with somebody that people would say, oh, she's only got that because she's with him. And so that was the thing I was worried about. And it's so hard, I suppose, when, you know, we had no connections to media and we felt as though getting our foot in the door was so out of the way. Like I applied Mm. everywhere. I definitely would have applied for a job at Mamma Mia and Pedestrian Mm. and SMH and I was applying everywhere and I couldn't even get a call back. And it just felt like getting your foot in that office was such a leap that I don't think we ever wanted anyone to think that it had been on the mm. basis of some connection that we actually that we didn't have. Didn't have. <laughs> yeah. It was sort of Because it was a year luck. or two years after you started. Mm. Yeah. Jesse, how did you weigh up that decision? It must have been really difficult. Yep, it was, but I also, like, the risk was attractive. <laughs> I also have this thing of like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And then I just. It's like the TikTok. Yeah, exactly. I did it. I did it. (laughs) Yeah, it was was that. And so I I can't say. Everyone around you said, this is a terrible idea. And my mum, my dad, everyone just was Mm. like, terrible idea. Because if it goes wrong. Mm. Mm. Which it absolutely could have, like every other bloody relationship I'd had for Mm. five or six years. But I think that I was leaning into this thing of like, go against your type and like, Try and find someone that you... But this is why I think so many relationships find themselves in workplaces because you're friends first and you really get along. And you also get to see... I remember thinking after a while when I actually did get on board with it, I thought it's quite romantic really because he's seen Jesse in her true Jesse state. You're never I'm more not yourself. ever more myself than at work. Whereas I was going yeah. on dates with guys being like... You're all dressed this isn't up me. And, yeah. and then you'd be like, you're not even yourself around that guy. Mm. And I was like, oh. Whereas with Luca, it's always just been... There was no guard to put up because, and you're putting yourself we'd always out been there. Equals, and you'd be mm. filming a video with him, and you had to really put yourself on the line. When yeah. did you get on board, Claire? And what made you get on board? I remember it was a few months in, and I can't remember what it was that he did, but he did something, and I had this like wave of realization that I thought. No, he's a really good guy and even if things went wrong, he'd look after you. Like he's he's one of those people because that was always my fear with the guys. He's not going to be vindictive. Yeah, yeah. there are a few people I look at like that because I'm very aware of those people who turn on you really quickly and that's what I was worried about. But I looked at him and I thought, no, I don't think he's ever hurt a fly. Like Mm. I can't imagine him hurting you even if it went wrong. And Luca getting together with Jesse, Claire, did it change your friendship with Luca and did it change Jessie? How did it change her? I think 
it changed my friendship with Luca a little bit just because he knew that I was against it. So that was a bit of an elephant in the room. Um, But then I think he's over it now. I don't know. I'm over it. But I think it really changed Jesse and our whole family says, because Jesse's had, yeah, lots of partners in the past and when she used to bring them over or talk to them on the phone, we used to say when she answered the phone and it was a guy, it was, it was like a different person was speaking. It just They do an her. impersonation of how I'd say hello. It was like, hello, and they'd be like, Ugh. it's like you don't, so that's not who you are. And, yeah. and Or you'd have guys over and you just think you're not acting like yourself. And so with Luca, I think we could all see straight away that she was exactly herself. I remember you, you went through that phase, this is really mean, but you got like cystic acne <laughs> and it was quite from a, too early on in the relationship early on. I'd say and it was quite early <laughs> Jessie got cystic <laughs> acne and it was it was pretty bad yeah. and I can say that because I then had it a few years later anyway it was very intense and I remember she just wouldn't wear any makeup <laughs> and was just like this is me and I remember one of our brothers had brunch with you and he's like god Jessie's skin but she's really happy and I was like yeah she is she is happy so I think it was sort of you were so comfortable in yourself and Luca didn't give a single crap and no. that was very nice to see. And there's even been like times when Claire's been down or whatever and I was out one night and I found out that Luca had gone and brought Claire ice cream. No, he didn't bring me ice cream. He knocked on the door. He said, come on, come on. And we went and we walked and we got ice cream. It was really kind. <laughs> I was really sad. <laughs> we got Messina. <laughs> People would say working with your sister and you're, in your case, Jesse, your partner and your partner's parents, it's a lot. Yes. What do you say to that? I just think it's with anything that anything becomes normal. Like people think that, oh, what's it like to be a twin? Or what's it's like, I don't really know. What it's like to not work different. with your boyfriend and his parents. Exactly. It's just how it is. And so you just make it work and then sometimes you forget someone comes in and you're like, oh, yeah, this is a bit weird. Or someone makes an assumption, mm. which can be really tough about how you got your job or favouritism or whatever. But our philosophy has always just been mm. let the work do the talking. Like I, you don't have to defend yourself and you don't have to make a big fuss, but if you work hard, then people can never argue with the work. Mm. Well, I'd like to dedicate this episode to Alice Gagnon because she's the former <laughs> Mamma Mia uh, parenting person, editor, parenting yes. editor, who posted mm. that recap of the two of you. Yes. And if I hadn't seen it, I can't imagine what my professional life or my personal life mm. and the life of my family would look like today. Where so- would I have lived this year? <laughs> I don't Lived know. Lived in the hut. I know. Would have been messed up. Yeah, I reckon we, I'd still be dating terrible people. We would have been goblins elsewhere. Yeah, goblins <laughs> elsewhere yeah. running around the streets. Yeah. Little sister goblins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes when you interview people you know really well, it can be a little bit weird because you don't have anything to ask them because you know it all already. But I found out so much in that conversation, oh, so much about their dating lives and the stuff about each other's partners, I found that absolutely fascinating. Jesse and Claire are so supremely talented. You can read their work on mamamia.com.au and you can hear more from Jesse on Mamma Mia Out Loud and True Crime Conversations. This episode was produced by Leah Porges. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff and I'm Mia Friedman. I'll see you on mamamia.com.au. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures.